Hey, I'm Spinny Chad, and today we're going to be seeing if I can fly an SSTO to length and back in Kerbal Space Program 2. SSTO, of course, stands for Single Stage to Orbit, meaning that this mission is going to be completely reusable. Uh, we can take this back and theoretically refuel it and send it out on another mission. The core of this SSTO, of course, is going to be the new Swerve Hydrogen uh, Engine, the Nuclear Hydrogen Engine. And we're going to put some wings very similar to the last video where we sent an SSTO to Gillian back, uh, but very much scaled up. Of course, we're going to turn the spring strength up on those back uh, wheels, and we're going to uh, turn the friction off on the front and turn the spring strength and dampening up on it as well. We're also going to limit uh, what each control surface can actually do here. We're going to have roll on the main wing control surfaces, then yaw, of course, on the vertical parts, and then those tips there are all moving. The, the entire thing moves back and forth, and that's going to control our pitch. Of course, the uh, little canard in the front there controls our pitch as well. And as you can see, we had a pretty uh, wonky time getting the center of mass to center of lift uh, correct and we're just going to go with the uh, three whiplash engines trying to go for a minimum here because that's a weight we have to carry around later on and three just seemed to be inadequate to get us up to the activation speed of the ram jets in those whiplash engines before we uh ran out of fuel we need to have extra fuel later on for our ascent at length so we need to uh, use about half of our fuel for the Kerbin ascent and save the rest for later on at length uh, every bit of the fuel that we can save is less fuel we have to use on our ascent at life. This last test run though with four whiplash engines performed a lot better and uh, I even left the landing gear down the entire ascent. That seems to be something I do a lot. I did that on the biggest SSTO that I ever made. Um, that really beastly uh, 2000 part one that I made. Uh, but it didn't affect this too much, honestly, because we ended up having 7,405 Delta V in orbit. That is vacuum Delta V. That is a lot of Delta V. Uh, but we're gonna test our little kneeling system here. See, I didn't actually have unlocked yet a, a ladder large enough to reach from the top command pod there down. So we came up with this way for it to kneel and then use the tiny uh, A-10 Warthog ladder there. Cause if you don't know that smaller mid-sized ladder there, that you uh, get in KSP is based on the A-10 Warthog's ladder. I immediately though took this all the way up to orbit. Uh, I wasn't gonna waste any time. It, it, the ladder worked and everything seemed to be fine, so I'm not gonna revert the flight. I'm just gonna go ahead and take it up to orbit. Now this wasn't actually as efficient as the first one. We ended up with a little bit under 7,000 Delta V, I think, once we actually got to orbit. And that's for a few reasons. One, I suck at SSTO since, even though I do them constantly. And then two, I added a bunch of science stuff in a little cargo bay in between these uh, two different missions here. So those probably cause a little bit of extra drag because cargo bays are currently kind of broken. They, they cause a lot of uh, drag themselves and then the things inside of them aren't really protected. You may have noticed we've already actually left Kerbin. Things are going to be moving pretty fast in this and we've got a very nice encounter with Jewel and we're going to bring it down to get an encounter with Lathe and when we pass by Lathe it should still some of our velocity and put us in orbit around Jewel completely free. No Delta V to actually get captured around Jewel which is exactly what we want. You can see there we've got the little encounter and the second that we fly by Lathe it's going to steal our velocity and slow us down to a very nice orbit around Joule, uh, one in which we can hopefully fly by Lathe again until we can finally slow down enough to land there. All saving as much Delta V as possible, because I'm not really quite sure how much a round trip there and back takes, because I've usually just done refueling on Lathe and stuff. So we're going to need to conserve as much as we can. Our little flyby there with absolutely no aero braking managed to get us a very nice high orbit, which is good because when you've got a very high orbit like that, you can move your periapsis around for very, very cheap when you're at your apoapsis or the farthest point in your orbit. It's uh, really cheap to move stuff around. We're going to get an actual encounter with uh, Val here, and that's going to straighten our orbit out because currently our, our inclination, our, our tilt of our orbit isn't lined up with the plane of uh, Jules moons here. So we need to have a pretty straight line up here to get reliable encounters with the different moons and use them for gravity assists, which is going to be uh, quite a few, not as many as you might think, but uh, here's our first gravity assist around a non lathe object. That's going to be Val. And I don't know if I fly by Tylo. I tried a few Tylo encounters, but Val, I think, might be the only one that we actually visit in this one. We've got a beautiful flyby of it. We will definitely be coming back to Val in the future. Val has some cool things going on, like uh, possible oceans on it and stuff like that. Pretty cool stuff going on at Val. So we will be coming back there in the future. Don't worry. But that has straightened out our orbit, and our next encounter is going to be a very nice one with Lathe. And you can see we almost line our orbits up with Lathe, meaning that it slowed down our velocity to a point where we're almost in orbit. While looking at our encounter with Lathe, I noticed that the spot that we're trying to land at is actually down there uh, toward the south pole of Lathe. So we need to actually mess up that nice uh, uh, flat inclination that we got and uh, get more of a polar kind of encounter with Lathe. 
length. That spot we're trying to land at, by the way, is something very special. It's a, uh, I wouldn't say it's an Easter egg since it's part of the main quest line missions, but it's definitely insanely cool. And it's going to be probably the coolest place that we visit in this series so far, other than probably the mud hole. But that's not, that's not canon. So here's our final encounter with Lathe, and I'm actually going to raise our periapsis a tiny bit there to 35,000 meters or 35 kilometers above the surface. Lathe's atmosphere starts at 50,000 and 30 was kind of pushing it and I was afraid we would burn up in the atmosphere. So we raised it a little bit and of course we're going to be doing as much science as kerbally possible on the way down. Now you may notice here we activate those little arrow brakes in the back. Turns out the arrow brakes are incredibly tough and uh, re-entry and arrow braking is best done in pointing straight up pro grade because the wings are kind of sensitive so we're going to be using those arrow brakes in the back for well arrow braking um, <laughs> we're going to be using air brakes for air braking who would have guessed we get a suborbital trajectory which wasn't quite what i was looking for but we bump it up a little bit to still suborbital but just a little bit less suborbital and we're going to use this to circularize our orbit and air another arrow break to circularize our orbit this mission was incredibly complicated and complex, if you can't tell already, and I'll try to break it down as best I can, but uh, this isn't our final arrow break. This is just to circularize everything. Um, and we get, of course, some more sites here. We finally got the air sniff test, I think, back, um, which takes two minutes, so that gives you a perspective of how long we were just burning up in the atmosphere. We got a nice circular orbit, and then we're going to bring it down very nicely right over top of that little island, which has the discoverable that we're going to, well, go discover. We're going to bring down our little impact trajectory there to quite a bit ahead of where we're actually wanting to land. You need to count for the, the planet's rotation and for, of course, the atmosphere slowing you down. Yeah, our elevators had some little flappy issues there. <laughs> I don't know what was up with that, but here's our final arrow braking there. We're going to activate our arrow brakes for the arrow braking. Uh, I think those look incredibly cool. And also, you may notice that the, uh, looks like to me, the re-entry heating there uh, looks looks very red compared to Kerbin. That may just be me overthinking, but I'm thinking that it's like uh, a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere or something. We're going to pull one of these maneuvers where we flip upside down and then uh, pull up. So we're basically doing the same thing as if you just push the nose down, but of course everyone's still experiencing those nice positive Gs. Now I want to be quiet here and let you guys experience what I did here. Completely unexpected and out of nowhere. Yeah, and then I forgot about that, and then it scared the crap out of me while I was editing too. Uh, maybe I'm just very easily scared, but uh, I was not expecting the craft to just explode like that. And it didn't do it again, despite doing more or less the exact same maneuver. Now, of course, we did have some issues with the center of mass to center of lift on this craft, and it ended up flying around like that in some spinning mayhem. Now, I kind of was expecting this to happen, and we quickly uh, and frantically pushed all of the remaining hydrogen fuel, which weighs next to nothing, but we pushed it all to the front tank there, uh, making it more nose heavy and bringing our center of mass back where it belongs, kind of. And luckily that helped kind of fix our problem. Once we got into the lower portions of the atmosphere, we were able to finally regain control. We wouldn't have be having these problems as much if uh, side tanks were more reliable than what they are. They just kind of fall off still, even with the reinforced joints. So uh, you kind of have to make these long, slender crafts that have really messed up center of masses whenever they run out of fuel. But you might notice in the distance there, it came from life. That is what we're after. The giant megafauna, super huge and cool skeleton here on life. And of course, we're going to do a very tight squeeze through the inside of that. That was the first try. That was the first time coming up on it. Uh, but we weren't so lucky with the landing. I mean, we got it very, very slow, but uh, we unfortunately kind of stalled out and we were able to bring it up and yeah, well, that happened. So we had to uh, unfortunately do a much more boring landing where we come in very low and uh, not quite as slow next to the uh, uh, giant skeleton here. Um, now we're going to be landing almost in the water. That's what that splash is about. The water comes up very shallow on these little islands. Much better than the uh, way it used to on the islands where just the sharp cliff at the end of most of the Lake Islands in the first game, if I remember right. But we're going to then taxi it back over there uh, to the uh, skeleton until we get to the skeleton's bow. And there you have it, folks. We've just flown an SSTO to Lathe, and we're going to get out our Kerbals. Now, of course, we don't have Jebediah Kermit on board because he did recently retire in the last video, and I'm sure he wouldn't want to have been on here because this is a very long mission. He just came back from a pretty long mission, so I'm glad he retired. But we plant a flag here, and then something quite peculiar happens. We get a mission complete whenever we plant the flag. Uh, 
Elbro Kerman, not to be confused with elbows, uh, Elbro, <laughs> uh, is going to run up to the skeleton here and get a surface sample, which I don't think I got on video, but that's how huge this thing is. Just look at how tiny he is. I'd also like to just point out how beautiful the scattering is here on Lathe and how beautiful the clouds are. It, Lathe looks as good as it ever has looked and it looks so freaking cool. I can't wait to come back here with some sort of colony or something. We're going to get out the first female Kerbal on Lathe and she's going to get a surface sample from the regular island biome uh, quite a bit away from the actual skeleton there. And we're going to do a very fancy ascent to orbit straight through the middle of the skeleton, right into its mouth and out the other side. <laughs> and uh, this made for a pretty darn cool shot if I do say so myself. And now I'm just worried about if we have enough uh, liquid fuel, enough methane left to actually send this thing up to Lathe orbit. Turns out we had just enough because uh, Lathe's orbital velocity in low Lathe orbit is about uh, 300, 400 meters per second slower than Kerbin. But we did have a bit of an issue. Uh, turns out we were technically still splashed in the ocean. This was a bit of a problem and I had to search up online how to get rid of this landed state. And after an hour or two of digging around in my files and finding the save and then turning the state to uh, orbiting rather than splashed, I was finally, luckily, able to fix this glitch. Now this is a pretty game-breaking glitch, especially if you don't want to dig around in your files. But now we're ejecting from Lathe into a regular jewel orbit and we're getting it set up till we don't run into any of the major moons and get kicked out of the system or something. Uh, and it turns out we had to wait a very, very long time for our apoapsis to line up with the retrograde of Jules' orbit, but we did finally get a encounter with Kerbin, and we did our little burn to go out to Kerbin, and uh, in no time we're actually going back home. This had to be very traumatizing for the astronauts on board, the Kerbonauts on board, uh, to see their home planet after so many years of being gone, only to fly back by it and uh, go back out into the solar system. But we are doing a burn here to return back to Kerbin, for another gravity assist to try to get our orbit lined up more with Kerbin again. On this pass, we're gonna to try to uh, do an aero break, a very risky and a very, very spicy aero break to slow ourselves down a little bit more at nearly 5,000 meters per second. That's a little over Mach 14 at sea level. Uh, that is that is an insane, <laughs> insane speed to do, uh, be doing a uh, aero break at. But there's one thing I've learned, you can kind of push the boundaries of how fast you can uh, uh, do this uh, re-entry heating. Uh, if you just stay prograde. And this did work out. Uh, we just stayed prograde and activated our aero, uh, air brakes in the back there and uh, had our landing gear out to slow down as much as possible. And it worked pretty good. We're going to get our third encounter with Kerbin. And this isn't actually our last one. There was another encounter, but I lost all of that footage because it, it turned out I was recording the wrong monitor for about two hours. So we're just going to skip to being in orbit around Kerbin in our final approach at the KSC. We got, uh, I think, two more encounters with Kerbin, and we finally, after one final spicy arrow break, got a nice, uh, nice orbit around Kerbin. Of course, we used up the last of our fuel, too, and uh, we're going to use up the very last few little drops of hydrogen on our tanks uh, to here in a minute just to push our orbit out a little bit uh, farther past the uh, KSC. I think I'm about to do that right here. Yeah, and we just push it out a little bit farther because I was afraid that we would uh, undershoot it. Um, I like to overshoot it and then come around, circle back around, and come in from the back of those runways. As you've probably noticed, I've done that in every single episode. That's just the approach that I'm really used to. And uh, boy, we had a lot of issues with this craft. If you think it was tail heavy whenever it was on lathe, you can bet with the all tanks on board completely empty, this thing was incredibly tail heavy. Also, uh, we actually accidentally left a little bit of oxidizer in the back little uh, adapter sections there that the engines are attached to. So it was even more tail heavy than it should have been. I gotta love those weird terrain glitches there. Don't pay any attention to those. But now after like 20 years in space, this thing is finally seeing the runway that it took off from originally. We're going to be landing here on runway two as usual, and we're coming in for a very weird and a very slow approach because uh, this thing was not very nice to control. It was wanting to tip forward and flip around and do all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, so we had to come in for a very weird landing and land way, way before the numbers. Uh, that is not safe by any, uh, any stretch of the means, but we did come to a complete stop and we didn't break anything landing. And that is what a mission to Lathe and back using only an SSTO looks like. We managed to go all the way there and all the way back using only one stage thanks to those wonderful nuclear engines. We did lose one part <laughs> in one of the spicy, spicy re-entries. It was our ladder. And we got a mission that we didn't actually complete, but we completed it. That's a weird glitch. 
Uh, it says that we landed a put a flag on pole, but it was actually on lake that we put it. But we're going to claim that anyway. <laughs> I'll take 3,000 sides. Thank you. Uh, we'll just go ahead and claim that. And we've got a bunch of new missions to play around with in the next episodes. And of course, we're going going on a shopping spree. Now, this isn't going to be buying anything groundbreaking. We're just going to be filling out some nodes and getting some more docking equipment. And that, that pretty much wraps everything up. But you might be wondering, where's Jeb? Yeah, Jeb is living out retirement in luxury. That's an actual Easter egg, by the way. You should go check it out in the swimming pools if you have KSB2. And thank you so much for watching this episode. It means the world to me and all the support that you guys give for the Aircraft Only series. Hopefully we'll be expanding to KSB1 soon with the Aircraft Only series. And that should be very interesting because KSB1 is a completely different beast. But that's all I've got for today. Thank you so much for watching again. This is Smoothie Chad, out.